Welcome to the second part teaching on nerves of the upper limb titled Ulnar Medial and Radial Nerves. The objectives for this teaching are to outline the course of the median, ulnar and radial nerves, to highlight each individual nerve functions, to outline injury levels and their deficits, and to understand what is the ulnar nerve paradox. We will begin with the median nerve and we will learn to describe it using the same structured approach used in the previous teaching. The median nerve is derived from the C5 to T1 nerve roots in the neck. It originates in the axilla from the medial and lateral cords of the brachial plexus. It travels down the anterior compartment of the arm. Initially, it's situated lateral to the brachial artery. But this then crosses anterior to the artery midway down the arm and ends medial to the artery before entering the cubital fossa at the level of the elbow. After passing through the cubital fossa at the level of the elbow, where it lies medial to the brachial artery, the median nerve enters the anterior compartment of the forearm as it passes between the two heads of prenatal teres. After this, it continues down the forearm deep to flexa digitorum superficialis. And in the anterior component of the forearm, it gives off two branches, an anterior interosseous nerve proximally as it passes between the heads of prenatal teres, and the palmar cuneidinous branch distally where it's given off just proximal to the carpal tunnel, passing superficial to the flexor retinaculum. At the wrist, it passes through the carpal tunnel lying between the tendons of flexor digitorum superficialis and flexor pollicis longus. As the nerve enters the hand, it gives off two terminal branches, the recurrent motor nerve branch and the palmar digital branch. The median nerve has both motor and sensory functions. Its motor function is divided into that supplied by the pure median nerve and that supplied by the anterior interosseous nerve branch. The pure median nerve supplies muscles in the anterior compartment of the forearm, which include flexor carpi radialis, pronator teres, palmaris longus, and flexor digitorum superficialis. It also supplies the loaf muscles in the hand, which are the radial to lumbricals, opponens pollicis, abductor pollicis brevis, and flexor pollicis brevis. The anterior interosseous nerve, which is a branch of the median nerve proximally in the forearm, supplies motor function to three muscles that lie deep in the anterior compartment of the forearm. These are pronator quadratus, flexor pollicis longus, and the radial half of flexor digitorum profundus. The median nerve provides sensation over the thena eminence via the palmar cutaneous nerve, which is indicated as blue on the picture shown and the palmar radial three and a half fingers and the respective dorsal fingertips by the digital cutaneous nerve as shown in green. Before we go on to speak about median nerve injuries, I just want to talk about some basic rules that are required when describing these nerve injuries. Firstly, we need to know the level of injury in the limb. This is because injury at different levels will produce different deficits. Secondly, you need to describe these nerve injuries as motor and sensory deficits. You need to remember that these deficits are not dermatomal in their pattern. And when it comes to motor deficits, you need to make the differentiation of whether it is weakness or there's total loss of power in that, in that movement. Weakness means that innovation to the muscles performing a specific movement is still present by the injured nerve or another nerve. However, loss means that innovation to all muscles performing a specific movement is compromised. Now we can talk about median nerve injuries in more detail. And as in the previous teaching session, we will talk about these injuries relating to their level, their mechanism of injury, and their motor and sensory deficits. We'll start talking about injury of the median nerve at the level of the elbow. This is caused by trauma, such as lacerations or supracondylar fractures, pronator syndrome, and the atrogenic causes. One would expect weakness in wrist flexion with wrist adduction, loss of forearm pronation, 
loss of middle and index finger flexion, weakness in little and ring finger flexion, loss of pincer grip, which is thumb flexion, loss of thumb apposition, and weakness in thumb abduction. There will also be thinner wasting. One would also expect sensory loss in the hand over the palmar thema eminence, the palmar lateral three and a half fingers, and the dorsal lateral three and a half fingertips. Injury at the same level but only affecting the anterior interosseous nerve, which is commonly caused by supracondylar fractures, one would expect weakness in forearm pronation, weakness of pincer grip, thumb flexion, and loss of middle and ring finger flexion at the distal interphalangeal joint. Sensory function remains intact because the anterior interosseous nerve is a pure motor nerve. Now looking at an injury at the wrist, this is commonly caused in, in carpal tunnel syndrome. However, it can also be caused in trauma lacerations and distal radius fractures, as well as iatrogenic causes. Injury at this level will cause weakness in pincer grip, which is thumb flexion, weakness in thumb abduction, loss of thumb apposition, and thinner wasting. There will also be sensory loss over the palmar lateral three and a half fingers and dorsal lateral three and a half fingertips. Sensation over the palmar thena eminence remains intact with an injury of the median nerve at the level of the wrist. And this is because the palmar cutaneous nerve branches from the median nerve before it enters the carpal tunnel. Let's move on and talk about the radial nerve. It's derived from C5 to T1 nerve roots at the level of the neck. It originates as the terminal branch of the posterior cord of the brachial plexus in the axilla, where it lies posterior to the axillary artery. The radial nerve leaves the axilla, passing inferiorly through the triangular interval into the posterior compartment of the arm along with the profunda brachial artery, and here it supplies the long and lateral head of triceps. Descending down the posterior compartment of the arm, it passes laterally along the spiral groove on the posterior surface of the humerus. In the distal arm, it pierces the lateral intramuscular septum and emerges anterior to the lateral epicondyle of the humerus. Here it lies between the brachioradialis and brachialis muscles. At this level, it divides into the deep and superficial branches of the radial nerve. And before dividing into these te two terminal branches, the nerve gives off branches to supply brachioradialis and extensor carpi radialis longus. In the forearm, it travels as two of the two branches, the deep branch within the posterior compartment and the superficial superficial branch in the mobile wad. The deep branch passes posteriorly between the two heads of supinata, becoming the posterior interosseous nerve. The superficial branch travels deep to brachyradialis and lateral to the radial artery. It passes over the anatomical snuff box as the dorsal cutaneous branch. The radial nerve has both motor and sensory functions. In the arm, it supplies triceps, minor contribution to brachialis, ancaneus, brachyradialis, and extensor carpiradialis longus. In the forearm, it supplies extensor carpiradialis brevis and supinata as the deep branch, and supplies the remaining muscles of the posterior compartment of the forearm as the posterior interosseous nerve. These are extensor digitorum, extensor indices, extensor pollicis longus, extensor pollicis brevis, extensor carpi ulnaris, abductor pollicis longus, and supinata. The radial nerve also supplies a vast area of sensation to the back of the arm. These are via the lower lateral cutaneous nerve of the arm, shown in green, the posterior cutaneous nerve of the arm, shown in blue, the posterior cutaneous nerve of the forearm, shown in yellow, and the superficial branch of the radial nerve, which supplies the first dorsal web space and the dorsum of the radial three and a half fingers up to the proximal interphalangeal joint. We'll now move on and talk about radial nerve injuries. We we'll begin at the level of the axilla, where a common mechanism known as Saturday night palsy results from direct compression of the radial nerve onto the humerus.
At this level, one would expect loss of elbow extension, loss of wrist extension and resulting wrist drop, and loss of finger and thumb extension. One would also expect sensory loss along the lower lateral arm, the posterior arm, the posterior forearm, and the first dorsal web space. Essentially, there is total deficit of the radial nerve function. At the level of the arm, common injury includes that of a mid-shaft humerus fracture. At this level, one would expect only weak elbow extension as supply to the lateral and, red and medial heads of the triceps remains intact. There will however be a loss of wrist extension with resulting wrist drop and loss of finger and thumb extension. There will also be loss, sensory loss of posterior forearm, lower lateral arm and the first dorsal web space. However, sensation to the posterior arm remains intact. At the level of the elbow, with common mechanisms including radial head dislocations and iatrogenic causes due to surgery, one would expect weakness in wrist extension with no wrist drop and this is because the injury that occurs is below the level at which extensor carpi radialis longus and brachioradialis are innervated. There will however be loss of finger and thumb extension. Sensory loss is only affected around the first dorsal web space and this is only if it's injured before the radial nerve branches into the deep and superficial branches. At the level of the forearm, common injuries include trauma lacerations and the atrogenic causes due to surgery. Now, injury at this level all depends which nerve is affected. If the posterior interosseous nerve is affected, there will be loss of finger and thumb extension. However, if the superficial radial nerve is affected, there will be only first dorsal web space loss of sensation. This is because the posterior interosseous nerve is a pure mutant motor nerve and the superficial radial nerve is a pure sensory nerve. At the level of the wrist, common injuries resulting from lacerations, there will be no motor loss as the posterior interosseous nerve ends before this level. However, there will be sensory loss at the first dorsal web space supplied by the superficial radial nerve. Moving on, we'll now speak about the ulnar nerve. It's derived from the C8 and T1 nerve roots in the neck. It originates in the axilla from the medial cord of the brachial plexus and descends in a plane between the axillary artery and vein. It travels down the medial aspect of the anterior compartment of the arm, with the brachial artery located laterally. In the midpoint of the arm, it pierces the medial fascial septum to enter the posterior compartment of the arm. At the elbow, it passes posterior through the cubital tunnel formed by a space between the medial epicondyle and the olecranon, all known as the cubital tunnel. The ulnar nerve passes into the anterior compartment of the forearm between the two heads of flexor carpi ulnaris. It travels initially between flexor digitorum superficialis and flexor digitorum profundus, but emerges in the distal forearm running deep to flexor uh, carpi ulnaris tendon. Throughout its uh, course in the anterior compartment of the forearm, it travels medial to the ulnar artery. Its main three branches given off um, in the forearm are the muscular branch, the dorsal cutaneous branch, and the palmar cutaneous branch. At the wrist, it emerges between the ulnar artery and flexor carpi ulnaris and travels superficial to the flexor retinaculum, passing through Guyon's canal to enter the hand. It ends as two terminal branches, the superficial cutaneous branch and the deep motor branch. The ulnar nerve has both motor and sensory functions. In the forearm, it supplies motor innervation to flexor carpi ulnaris and the anterior half of uh, flexor digitorum profundus. In the hand, it supplies the majority of the intrinsic muscles of the hand, which are the palmar and dorsal interosse, adductor pollicis, the ulnar two lumbricals, the muscles of the hypothenar eminence, and the palmaris brevis muscle. It also provides sensation to the medial half of the palm via the palmar cutaneous branch the palmar surface of the ulnar one and a half digits via the superficial cutaneous branch and the dorsal surface of the ulnar one and a half digits via the dorsal mm -hmm. cutaneous branch.
We now talk about um, injuries of the ulnar nerve. I'm going to begin at the level of the elbow. Common mechanisms at this level would be cubital tunnel syndrome, trauma, as with elbow dislocations, supracondylar fractures, and medial epicondylar fractures, and the atrogenic uh, causes during surgery. The motor deficit one would experience at this level would be weak wrist flexion with abduction of the wrist, weak flexion of the little and ring fingers, loss of thumb abduction, which causes a Froman's positive sign, and loss of finger abduction. You'd also have wasting of the hypothena eminence and the interosseum muscles at the back of the hand. With an injury at this level, you'd also expect sensory loss over the medial palmar surface of the hand and the palmar and dorsal surfaces of the under one and a half fingers. Injury at the level of the wrist, commonly caused due to trauma lacerations and the atrogenic causes, one would expect a motor deficit motor deficit causing loss of thumb abduction and the Froman's positive sign and loss of finger abduction. You'd also have the similar wasting as you'd expect with an injury at the level of the elbow. However, this sensory loss one would experience would be loss of sensation over just the palmar um, ulna one and a half fingers. The rest will be preserved unless the injury is more than five centimeters proximal to the wrist. The last thing we're going to talk about today is the on and off paradox, and this is something very important to understand. It is clawing of the hand that appears more pronounced with an on and off injury at the wrist compared to an on and off injury at the level of the elbow. And why is this? At the level of the elbow, you have a loss of on and half of flexor strong fundus and the on two lumbricals whilst flexor superficialis remains intact as its innervation comes from the median nerve. At the level of the wrist, however, you have just loss of the ulnar two lumbricals, and the flexor profundus and flexor superficialis functions remain intact. And the reason this happens is all down to the lumbricle muscles. The lumbricals' uh, function is to cause flexion at the metacarpophalangeal joint and extension at the interphalangeal joints. So in an unlinearth palsy, the clawed appearance in the hand occurs due to hyperextension at the metacarpophalangeal joint and flexion at the interphalangeal joint. And this is worse and more pronounced with the injury at the level of the wrist because the action of both flexor profundus and flexor superficialis um, causing flexion um, at the interphalangeal joints remain intact. And therefore, this gives a worse clawing appearance in the hand compared to uh, an injury at the level of the elbow, where because the ulna half of flexor profundus is lost, the, um, the degree of flexion at the interphalangeal joint is less pronounced. This is the end of our teaching, and thank you for listening. Our last slide is just here just to summarize some of the important details of some of the nerves we've talked about today. And these are their root levels, the cords they branch off at, um, and the level of the axilla from the brachial plexus, structures they pass through as they transition to different compartments and different levels of the upper limb, and structures that they're closely related to. Thank you.